As we told you about a couple of minutes ago in this newscast, the governor has pulled a proposal where the state would have leased Belle Isle from Detroit, but technically there are still two more days for the city council to act on this. So just how much would Belle Isle improve under the state lease? Right now, Michelle Hodges with the Belle Isle Conservancy is with Carolyn. Carolyn? Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us tonight. Uh, tell us first, how disappointed are you that the council decided not to vote on this and that the governor pulled it off the table? Well, leaders lead uh, whether the circumstances are challenging or not. So we continue to remain focused on our mission of protecting preserving, restoring, and enhancing Belle Isle. For people who don't understand exactly what the Belle Isle Conservancy do does and has done in the past, let us know. How many improvements have you made on the island? Well, the Belle Isle Conservancy has a remarkable record of success. We have over 4,500 volunteers dedicating more than 7,500 volunteer hours in a year. We've opened the aquarium, all entirely based on volunteer labor. We've restored, we've um, done electrical upgrades, pathway upgrades, roof upgrades. We've raised over $400,000 in one year. And that's just the beginning. We feel a tremendous amount of momentum of those who really want to come together and help advance Belle Isle. We did a user survey uh, using the project for public spaces, and they were overwhelmed at the data that they got back and said there are parks around the country that would die for the type of level of support that we have. So it's our job to harness that, and that's not going to go away. So what kind of comments do you hear from Detroiters? I mean, is this a Detroit thing versus a state thing? We heard so many people speak out at council meetings. In fact, one lady was saying yesterday, well, if, if Detroit were um, still an all-white city, maybe the state wouldn't try and take it over. I mean, when you hear comments like that, are you disappointed or how do you feel? Well, certainly as I was contemplating my own remarks for the hearings, uh, it, it, was, it was simple to want to rely on data. But I, I started thinking, I thought, it, it really isn't about the data. That case is easy to be made. It gets down to trust. And at some point, we as a community have to begin trusting one another. And we need to do that with baby steps. And using documents like a lease that are very well put together, we can protect our interests and, and, and get to a more trusting mode. Okay, Stephen, let's turn it over to you because I know a lot of people are talking about this on social media as well. Yeah, a lot of people, uh, most of the tweets and the Facebook comments uh, reflect disgust and disappointment with the council over this uh, particular uh, non-decision today not to vote. Uh, but I did get a comment here from, uh, from Steve on Twitter who, uh, who wonders if that $11 fee that people would be required to pay to get in the park perhaps caused this not to happen. I, I, people were confused about what this $11 fee really was and how long it lasts and all that kind of stuff. And whether it's a yearly fee or every time you go to the park you have to pay $11. It's an annual fee and that will get you into any state park in the state and it's whoever you can pack into your car or if you choose to walk on or ride your bike on you don't have to pay the fee at all. Wow, $11 per vehicle once a year and I mean could have done so much good. With a, a we'd polish our jewel. Last yes. quick question, do you think they might take another vote? I, at this point, I would say no. Uh, so we're staying focused on the long-term solutions and, and helping the legacy of Frederick Law Olmsted to live on. And moving forward. Thank yes. you so much, Michelle Hodges, for joining us tonight. Stephen.